All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming here and welcome to the first webinar of the year for Nasalsa. I'm very excited uh, for this event and I'm excited to hear some of these wonderful professors speak on their experiences, as well as give our executive board the opportunity to chat with these professors and get to know them. So does everybody have their chai ready? All ready to go, perfect. <laughs> That's great. So as we kick off this chai chat, I just wanted to introduce our amazing guest speakers. So first we have Professor Seema Mopata of SMU Dedman School of Law. She received her JD from Northwestern University and her research primarily focuses on fields of healthcare equity, the intersection of biosciences, reproductive justice and public health law. Before becoming a professor, she worked in transactional health law and compliance in Chicago. We have Professor Asha Schleslo, I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly, of America, American University, Washington College of Law. She received her JD from Georgetown University Law Center and her work revolves around the development of health law and policy curriculum. And she has worked with many law schools developing their health law curricula. Before becoming a professor, she worked in big law, practicing healthcare regulatory counseling, corporate compliance and transactions. Uh, can you tell me how to pronounce your last name? Yes, it's Shelzo. Shelzo. Okay, thank you so much. And then we have uh, Professor Shoba Wadla of Penn State Law, who received her JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Her scholarship focused on the role of prosecutorial discretion in immigration law and the intersection of race, national security, and immigration. Prior to becoming a professor, she was deputy director for legal affairs at the National Immigration Forum in Washington and provided legal and policy expertise on many legislative efforts, such as the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. We also have Professor Anita Sina of American University Washington College of Law, who received her JD from NYU School of Law. She's the director of the International Human Rights Clinic at American, where she supervises the representation of non-citizens in the U.S. immigration system. Prior to becoming a professor, she had worked in many civil rights litigation and human rights advocacy issues, such as the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. So, as always, I just wanted to reiterate my appreciation uh, to the professors for making time out of their day today to chat with us. So thank you. It is great to see you all here, even if it's virtually. I really welcome this opportunity. And I think one of the most amazing things or one of the positive things that I think has come out of this is just being able to connect um, virtually through Zoom and make sure that we connect on a nationwide platform. So I'm just really excited to get the opportunity to speak to professors from all across the um, United States. So let's, uh, I wanted to allow my executive board members to just go around and introduce themselves and their roles since it's the first webinar and just so you are familiar with our board. Uh, so I will pass it off to uh, David Matthews, our vice president. Yeah, uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces here. Um, my name is David Matthews. I'm the vice president of NASALSA. Um, I also do attend American University of Washington College of Law. I'll pass it on to Deepthi. Hey, all. My name is Deepthi. I'm at 3L at SMU Demon School of Law. I'm really excited to speak with you all today, and I'm really excited to drink some chai with you all, too. Oh, sorry, I'll pass it on to Anika. Hi, um, my name is Anika. I am a 1L at uh, Washington and Lee University School of Law, um, and I am the content director. I'm a new addition to the board, but I'm really, I love everybody so far, so yeah. Um, hi everyone, I'm Vinanti. I'm a 1L at Penn State Dickinson Law, and I'm the webinar and conference director, so Nice to see all the professors I was talking to over the past week or so. Yes, I just want to give a special shout out to Vinanti. She's the one that arranged this and reached out to the professor. So thank you so much for your work you're doing. Uh, and I am really grateful to work with this board. It's been a really good time and we have some great plans. So I look forward to continuing on our programming. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and kickstart our questions. So um, I wanted to pass it off to Vinanti, who has the first question. 
Awesome. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, so my question is to all the professors. All of you have worked in the fields of health or immigration, both fields that are very sensitive in the South Asian diaspora in North America. Um, could you tell us a bit more about how you got into that field and how you would say growing up in North America as a South Asian impacted your decision? Um, we can, whoever wants to go first. I'm happy to start if that's okay with everyone. Great. Well, first of all, thank you so much. What an honor it is to be invited. And I really think the students, you guys are outstanding uh, leaders in organizing this event, putting so much thought into it. Um, and now many of you, you know, one else. Uh, so really outstanding. Um, and I'm delighted to meet some of the professors here that I don't know. So hopefully we'll be able to stay connected. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm Asha Shelzo and I direct the Health Law and Policy Program at American University, Washington College of Law. And health law has been my career since day one. Um, it's actually an area where we do see a lot of South Asian presence. Um, and I think maybe some of that stems from the roots that many of our communities have in medicine. Um, and in healthcare and in science. And I think maybe that could, uh, you know, speaking of course generally, um, maybe account for why you do see a really wonderful uptick in South Asians in the legal side of that industry. Myself, I always tell this story to students that I was 100%, no doubt in my mind, pre-med for my entire life, as long as I can remember. I was pre-med and I went to college with that and I interviewed with that. I took the MCATs, I did well. You know, it was one of those things where I'm going to medical school, baby, that's it. Um, and about senior year of college, I said, you know, the thing about medical school is I'm gonna have to become a physician. And as much as I love medicine and I love healthcare, I don't know that that is the role I wanna have in this big, complex, wonderfully exciting and fascinating industry, which I still find to be extremely fascinating and interesting. But somehow, finally, that maturity sort of kicked in in senior year of college to say, what is the role I think I'd be good at or best at? And so I pivoted pretty quickly. I worked for a year in a healthcare consulting firm in, in Washington, DC, and then applied to law school, ended up at Georgetown. I think we've got some Georgetown colleagues here as well. And knew from the minute I went to law school that I was interested in health law, the idea of understanding all of the legal, regulatory, compliance, transactional challenges related to the healthcare industry. And so that choice has really served me well. And I do think I feel when I was at law school, this was 25 some years ago, there weren't a lot of South Asians in law. And I don't want to speak too categorically, but I will, I will say without knowing all the statistics that there really is a night and day difference now in terms of the number of South Asians entering the legal field as law students or other legal professionals. So I was maybe, you know, one of a handful in my entire school and, you know, maybe even in, that was the case in other schools as well. But again, I do think that health law lends itself because a lot of people were familiar perhaps with medicine or healthcare because of their South Asian upbringing, myself, my father being physician, all of our friends being physicians or in sciences of some kind. And so maybe there was a little bit more of that familiarity that puts more South Asians thinking about law and health law specifically. Um, and so now I have all these amazing colleagues on today's call, but there's just a real robust network of health lawyers now for, for South Asian health lawyers around the country. And there's a real pipeline, which I'm so proud of that there's there's folks like you guys, one else, you know, people who are just, you know, at the beginning of their legal career. And there's more advanced folks like me and others who sort of was like, you know, I've been around a while and it's so wonderful to see this growth. I will follow. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yes, I echo everything. I just said you guys are amazing and this is a fantastic opportunity. Happy to meet you all and to be in community with my fellow South Asian women. Um, so I have, um, my career has been very um, sort of curvy <laughs> in terms of uh, the areas that I have been interested in. I will say that I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer from a very young age and that is because of my um, parents who were both, you know, sort of highly educated. They came in the 70s after the end of the, you know, quota system and the beginning of the sort of brain drain from the subcontinent. And, um, you know, they were college educated. My mom was only 18, so she was, you know, undergrad and grad school in the US from New York City. Um, but with their accents and with their inability to really know 
the ins and outs of this, you know, social system that they're in. I just saw like these, you know, micro and macro aggressions against them all the time that they didn't even maybe maybe they didn't notice in retrospect, but you know, they just like I I just wanted to know the system of this country and be able to use it for good, right? So that was sort of my driving force through college and yet ultimately in law school. When I got to law school, so I was also, you know, a very ardent feminist. Um, I went to Barnard College and, um, you know, had this woman's rights sort of um, bent from the get-go, especially seeing that my mother, after almost finishing her PhD in math, wasn't allowed to or didn't for social pressures and stayed home and took care of us and, you know, felt like a real waste in mind, honestly. Um, and so I wanted to do better for like our women, because I saw my aunts and a lot of other women in that situation. But the feminist women's rights movement didn't really speak to me at the time. We're talking about the early 2000s. It was quite white. Um, I venture to say that might still be the case, but and there was also like a lot of sort of cultural <laughs> insensitivities that I had issues with. I remember um, interning at Unifem. I think it was the end of my college time and, you know, all this sort of hoopla around FGM, you know, genital mutilation and cutting and sort of the women from these countries were like, what about sort of domestic violence and other things that sort of Western ideas and there was just like cricket. So I was feeling a little bit um, alienated in the sort of women's rights world. And then I got to my third year and I got to take the immigrant rights clinic um, at NYU and I started to sort of work in the intersectionality of, um, of women's rights and immigration status, right? And otherwise um, sort of entering that world. And so my first fellowship out of law school was designed for that. And I've been in that sort of trajectory since sort of trying to, even in the clinic that I run right now, we definitely focus on gender related and other sort of violences, uh, violence related to non-citizens, right? So um, I think that being South Asian, being in my community, you know, being sort of the firstborn of my parents really got me to where I am today and, and drove my interests. Thank you. I have a much more boring story, um, but you know, I, I'll say that I was a little bit of the black sheep in my family um, because I was maybe middle school um, and pretty active and conscious and questioning everything around me. So I think it was, you know, really, you know, seventh grade history interrogations as kind of where it began for me. And, and also learning how influential, you know, judges and the legal system can be. Um, so I was, uh, oh, and I should have said, thanks to each of you, I'm thrilled to be here, um, that I wanted, you know, I knew I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. I didn't really know what that meant. Um, and, once I got to college, I uh, was still on the trajectory of wanting to go to law school, also playing piano, the two worst things that, you know, Indian immigrant parents want your kids to do is to, is to go to music school or to be a lawyer and make no money. Um, so, um, and what is this public interest thing, right? So, so all of these things are very foreign concepts, right, to your Indian immigrant parents. Um, like Anita, mine, mine came, you know, close after the 1965 Act. Um, so we were kind of the first arrivals, if you will, um, to the country. Um, and I actually thought I was going to go into human rights, civil rights, not defined. Maybe some of the one else here are feeling the same energy. Um, what am I going to do with my life? But then I took immigration law and I... I fell in love with the statute, and that's the part that makes my story a little more boring. Um, it's a really complicated code, and it's something that I intellectually connected with immediately. Um, the references, the cross-references, um, and while I thought I was going to leave the country and work globally, it really became a field where the world comes to you. And so I, you know, it's sort of also fulfilled um, the, the human interest um, side of law um, and the sort of equity side that I was passionate about, um, but I needed the rigor as well. And so um, it's a field I've been in for over 22 years, and it's the only practice area um, I've been involved in. 
you know, I, I could tell you that my immigrant story is the reason I went into immigration law, but it really didn't work that way. Um, it was a it was a confluence of other factors. I think I think about my identity more now, um, you know, much later in my career, um, and how it relates to to law and the next generation. Thank you guys so much for having me here, and um, I will just say that my you know I went to Johns Hopkins for college, and so. I was obviously pre-med um, and I graduated early. Um, I never really loved, you know, I, I didn't, unlike other people, even though there were a lot of Indians that were physicians, I didn't have any doctors in the family. Um, it was just kind of what I had thought I'd wanted to do. I graduated a year early. I went to get my MPH um, in chronic disease epidemiology and thankfully lived in the same dorms as med students because I hadn't really had, you know, contact with med students before and realized like there's no way I'm going to be doing this. Like I do not, you know, I had this idea of what, like I was much more interested in policy than the actual day-to-day -day, um, of what med students do. And so I had never considered law. I was a women's studies and um, natural sciences major in college. And I took a public health law class at Yale where I was getting my MPH. And that was kind of where I was like, oh, I could do this. And so I went to law school with that idea. Um, it kind of, it, it really, and then law school itself was exactly the way my brain worked. It was like where I, you know, I can't believe I hadn't been you know, pre-law before it really made sense to me, even though I probably studied more my first year of law school than I did in grad school and college combined. Um, but um, it really, I knew, I went through law school knowing that I wanted to do healthcare law. Public health law is what I thought. And then I worked in big law um, for five, you know, five to six years. I was on maternity leave at the end. So officially six, but, um, and it was not, you know, what I had pictured working on wasn't what I was working on in terms of when you have clients that, you know, they're going to pay you a certain amount of money to do this work. It might, you don't really get to drive it. And so I've thought the shift to academia was a lot more um, personally fulfilling in terms of being able to, you know, work on issues that were important to me. And my dad is a professor as well. And so I was kind of used to thinking about life in like semesters. And um, and so that, I mean, that's kind of the way that I got to where I, I was going. And I am an immigrant myself. I moved uh, to the US in 84 and I grew up in Beirut, Lebanon. That's where I was born. And so my dad um, moved from the American University of Beirut um, to the States. And so I, I'm first generation. Thank you so much, professors. Yes, thank you. We're gonna pass it off to the second question. Yeah, that actually um, really does just go right into my question, which is that I know that some of you have experience working in firms or just private law um, before teaching or you know just working in public service. What would you say are the highlights or the drawbacks, any differences? Um, of working in these two environments, do you do you feel any difference? Um, do you have a preference for what you do? Um, yeah, a little bit on that. I can go ahead and start uh, just in terms of rotation. So I think I'm understanding that you want me to sort of contrast the big law firm practice with the academic world now. So I would say I was with the big law firm practice for about 15 years and I've been in academia for about 12. So obviously there was a lot of overlap. Um, it wasn't you know, on stacking on each other um, and they're very different. Um, while we all cover health law, you know, we, all, we all concerned with policy. Um, it's just very different when you're serving clients in that kind of demanding environment um, where there's a billable hour. You are, I think I was doing timesheets at the 10th of an hour. So every six minutes uh, accounting for your time. So there's a lot to be said there. Um, they're billable hour targets. Um, the client expectations have only escalated. Um, they were already getting pretty uh, challenging when I was still in farm life. 
I was one of the few people who resisted a BlackBerry, which is sort of way before smartphones. So the idea of having your email sort of with you uh, was like, mm, we don't really need that, do we? You know, so I was one of those people who resisted it. We, you know, of course, every lawyer ended up having one at the firm at some point. But there wasn't that expectation that if you weren't there, you weren't there or you weren't constantly sort of plugged in. Obviously, that's changed quite a bit. Um, and I think the expectations of clients have therefore really escalated this on-demand feeling, this feeling that rates are so high, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 an hour, maybe close to 1,500, 1,800, depending on the kind of work you're doing and the firm you're in per hour. So when you have that kind of a culture and that kind of a way of thinking, um, it creates some challenges. Um, but I certainly thrived on it. I love transactional work. That was sort of my base of healthcare, hospital M&A, joint ventures, things of that nature. Um, it's exhilarating work when you feel like you're serving a client and you are serving their mission. What I love about healthcare is the majority of my clients um, are, were nonprofit. And I think that's often the case for many who are in the healthcare field. Not all exclusively, but many are nonprofit. Many of them have a particular mission, tax exemption, religious mission, perhaps, educational mission. And even our for-profit clients ultimately have a mission to serve the community with respect to healthcare. So you always felt like you were furthering a mission in assisting on a matter um, with those clients. Um, contrasting that with academia, of course, for me, I look back on the students I've worked with since I came to AU in 2010, and also I've worked with Georgetown, Penn, Loyal, other law schools, and to have that connection with a student is really hard to um, trade uh, with something else. You know, you're shaping somebody's career, you're, you're having an impact on them. You're one person, you're not the only person, but you're part of their village of people trying to think about how they wanna shape their career, so I think that has been incredibly um, rewarding for me. I see folks who are now partners at Big Law or they're judges, or these are people who are in my class as students, you know, and they're speaking at conferences and whatever it is they're doing. Um, it's so wonderful to know that you were a part of their education. So I always like to think of it at AU that we are sort of shaping the next generation of lawyers, right? And all, all of us as professors, all of us are doing that. Um, so that that's sort of my view of the two roles. I think they're both very worthy. One day I'd love to work in government or work in house. I need to be braver, I think, for those jobs than I am. I think um, I'm getting there in my courage, but, um, but there's so many ways in which we can serve the industry. And I think healthcare is in particular, it's so broad. There's so many ways you can serve it and you don't have to feel that, oh, well, you know, I have to do this job or that job. You know, any way you can serve the industry, you are serving health in people's health and wellness, which is to me, their most intimate aspect of their life. It's the place where people are most vulnerable is with their health or their family member's health. Um, and so we can help make that process better, smoother, make the um, client solve problems, um, then it's really rewarding, I think, as lawyers on whichever side you're on. I can jump in um, in terms of thinking about the difference. Um, so Asha <clears throat> said it very nicely. Um, so I worked, um, I had nonprofit clients as well, mostly large physician groups and large hospital systems, but, and um, some, you know, um, foundations, but mostly my clients were pharmaceutical companies uh, did, doing healthcare compliance. And so, and I had actually worked at a pharmaceutical company while um, getting my MPH. So it was a little bit different in terms of not what I necessarily thought I would be doing. Um, but some of the benefits of, you know, benefits of working at a large firm is first of all, like very resourced. Um, so personally, allowed me to pay off my loans quicker. Um, personally, it also allowed me, you know, there's a lot of training. There are senior associates, junior associates, partners, so that I felt like there was a lot of support. I wasn't kind of um, just kind of put in there without knowing what to do. So there was, there were a lot of um, people that I could ask things. My least favorite thing was the six minute billable, you know, accounting for my time. And I have always been really efficient. And I remember getting talked to um, that, you know, the associate down the hall, we're working the same project and that he was like billing like double for the same project, same work product. 
And I was like, yeah, isn't that bad? <laughs> like I'm faster and I'm, but it's, you know, the, the underlying kind of message was obviously like either say you're bill, you know, the client's willing to pay that you're more or, you know, spend more time on it, which I, you know, that was my least favorite thing about being at a firm. I am very close friends with my, the, some of my colleagues that I worked at in my firms though, and I have kept in touch with them, you know, so many years later, uh, for academia, I kind of, you know, both the students and the opportunity to kind of work on research that I think is important have been really important to me. I've watched my father kind of go to students' weddings and being such a big part of um, his life. And now that I have been teaching since 2000. Five, <laughs> um, you know, it's I have a lot of you know students that are you know are way more successful um, than I you know ever was, and it's great to see. And um, you know, I, I really cherish those relationships. So it, it's a much more personally fulfilling. Uh, financially, you know, it's a totally different scale, um, and so that's also one thing to consider in terms of academia versus uh, being at a firm. Um, you know, I, I think that that is something to be realistic about in terms of what you're planning on and what you know what your situation looks like. Those are great comments. I, you know, I I have to say I I think that. The journey for me was very organic. So some people have a very orchestrated and strategic plan of what their professional um, timeline is going to look like and what they need to do to get to the next level. I had none of that, right? So I just, I kind of let sort of my passion and my interest kind of drive um, what I was going to do first and what I was going to do next. Um, so I started working for, um, they call it a boutique immigration law firm in downtown DC uh, while I was a law student and, you know, was working on lots of cases and was very fortunate to, from the very beginning of my career, have really good bosses, right? Because you, you don't know if a place is ethical or if you have a good, you don't find out any of these things until you're inside. Um, and I feel very fortunate that each of the spaces, I've only been in three in the last 23 years, have, have all um, been positive, you know? So, so I was in private practice doing exclusively immigration for the old agency Immigration and Naturalization Service. Um, I was not on, I was the only associate who was not on billable hours, um, but I was the junior associate that went to, you know, every 7.45 a.m. asylum interview in Baltimore, right? So the hours were pretty endless, um, but it was a sort of broad scale immigration practice that did removal, pro bono, low bono, but also business immigration, um, H-1Bs, um, employment-based immigration. So I got to learn a lot without the billable piece, but the hours were long and so were the emotions. Um, I left private practice primarily because of 9-11 and that I actually would tie to my identity um, because it became harder to practice immigration. Um, and um, I also just had a pull to wanna have broader lasting change, which is what moved me into policy. So I was in nonprofit um, for the next six and a half years um, at the forum. Um, and there, that was a very political job as well. Um, so it really allowed me to learn the relationship between law and policy and politics and the relationship between the three. Because if you don't know all three languages, you're not going to push agendas. Um, past the finish line. Um, and it was during that time at, that I was also started teaching at American and at Howard as an adjunct um, and was, you know, very supported. Um, and that's when I also said, I really love teaching. Um, so then I went on the market um, and um, came to Penn State in 2008. It's my first academic job. Um, we still have a lot of clients because I run a clinic called the Center for Immigrants' Rights. Um, Central Pennsylvania is a very different place um, to practice immigration or do progressive things. Um, so uh, 
we can talk about that later, but I, I don't have any regrets or um, moments in my career that I would say that I would do differently. And students constantly ask me, um, what should I do first, right? Should I, I wanna be an advocate. Should I, should I go into policy first or should I go into private practice? Oh, but I also have my loans to pay off. Um, and really my response is there, there isn't a wrong way to, to, to go into the legal profession, right? Um, and a lot of this does happen organically for us. So if you have to go work at a big law firm, go work on a pro bono case um, involving asylum. You know, making partner and making a difference are not either or options. So, um, so I, I really want to impress that upon uh, the students too. I'll be brief just because I think out of my colleagues, I have done the least amount of firm work, which was as a paralegal at undergrad where I wanted to, was very eager to learn about the law, um, but then as only one summer in a big law firm in New York City. And Honestly, I did that because I wanted to show my parents that I did it and I rejected it. So that's where I come from. I have come from privilege in that my law school had a very good loan repayment program. So I was able to do my nonprofit work from the beginning and get my loans paid back within the 10 years um, that they were um, outstanding. Um, I will say though, that I am not of the ilk of you know nonprofit sort of public advocacy folks that look down on firm work. It is absolutely not, I think, right at all. Um, I think as Seema mentioned the training. I mean, obviously, like, I mean, I got to go into nonprofit through a two-year fellowship, right? Which is like the nonprofit I worked with um, was not equipped to hire me as like a newbie lawyer, right? Did not have the ability to train me. And so I came with money. So that's why they, I was able to work there, right? So there's a lot that, that that goes with, you know, sort of having just a public interest career like I did. Um, so people who work for firms for whatever reasons, I mean, the one thing that comes out of it is that they're trained well, right? I really learned my litigation skills when I joined Advancement Project, which is a big national organization in, in 2006. And I co-counseled with a big law firm on a federal um, public housing case. And I really learned litigation then mostly through the associates at Jenner and Block, but also um, through some of the senior uh, attorneys there. So um, that's all I'll say about that because I have the least amount of firm experience, but I do not um, think that it's anything wrong with doing firm work. Thank you all. I will pass it on to the next question. Yeah, I think you've all kind of touched upon this in your answers in previous ways. You've answered some questions, but uh, as someone who is at a law school that has a, a lot, uh, a, a good amount of South Asian faculty, I see that representation really matters in the law school context. But we also have members across the nation and also in Canada and North America that do not have South Asian faculty on their staff. Um, and so I just wanted to know whether any specific challenges relate to being South Asian that you faced in getting into academia or being where you're at today? I'll start briefly on this one. It's a great question you asked, David. Um, I wouldn't say there have been challenges necessarily connected with being South Asian per se. Again, I mentioned a couple of law schools earlier. They are all very inclusive communities. And maybe again, it's sort of the uh, good fortune I've had with those particular schools. So I can't you know, speak to others, but I will say that anytime you are sort of entering a space where there aren't a lot of people ahead of you that look like you, right? Then there is going to be some challenge. There's going to be some, you know, sort of trying to kind of break through or, or be one of the first, you know? And, and I'm certainly not one of the first at, at all, it, but it felt like that in some communities where I did go. Um, one of the first even sort of South Asian, you know, more senior at the firm or what have you, or um, in an association in leadership or, you know, so there's definitely been some of the firsts um, for people kind of of my generation as South Asian women in particular, but South Asians I'd say in general. And so I think when there are footsteps sort of ahead of you that you can follow and kind of step your foot into those footprints, that can be in some ways more comfortable or easier. It's not always the best way because if you just have these paths that are laid out and you just kind of everybody follows that same path, well, then we lose innovation and we use that lose creativity. 
Um, but so for a lot of us who didn't really have any sort of South Asian faculty member themselves, or, you know, that role model or somebody to say, hey, can you help me? It was difficult. Um, so for me to begin teaching was really difficult because I wasn't looked at as the traditional candidate for teaching in the sense that I was a practitioner, big law. And so it was really hard for me to teach um, in the beginning. And so that I really took that seriously that, oh, I've given this opportunity to teach. I'm really going to do it well and put a lot of energy into it. But again, I, because I didn't have a South Asian professor and I didn't have someone to call on to say, you know, how should I build this course? I'm building it from scratch. You know, I don't even know how to build a syllabus. And so I do think there's some of that challenge sometimes, but I would say that I was fortunate to be in inclusive communities. But I know now that I mentor a lot of younger, more junior lawyers who want to get into teaching, whether they're South Asian or not. Because I can say, oh, well, here's how I, you know, here's how you should think about a syllabus and here's how you might think about assessments and all these things that I really just had to do by myself. And so to maybe indirectly answer your question, David, it wasn't that I had really extreme challenges, but I just didn't have somebody there to guide me or somebody who kind of cleared the path for me. And maybe that took me longer. Maybe that created a little bit more frustration, but, but it's okay. I think sometimes when you're going in a direction that others haven't gone, that's the price you pay. I'll oh, go ahead, Anita. Thank you, Shiva. Um, I'll just follow up quickly and say that um, I feel very privileged. I, I didn't take like Shoba, I did not. I, I mean, I turned down a second sort of clerkship. Like, so I clearly wasn't looking into academia. And then I, I thought I suffered enough in law school. So I didn't want to suffer anymore. Um, but I wound up in clinical teaching because I realized, um, as Asha said, you know, you could really form the next generation of. Um, in my case, um, social justice, public interest students. Um, but I will say that since I've been in academia, it feels a little heavy, you know, for two reasons. One is that, um, you know, I, I, I take very seriously my role in being a good role model for South Asian and other students of color, um, non-traditional students, first gen students. But it's a lot of work and it's invisible work for the most part. You know, it's not, I just went up for tenure and it wasn't part of my tenure file, right? Like, but it's a lot of my job. And a lot of it's because I teach a lot of 3Ls in clinic. They've come from two years of being pretty battered in law school. And then I'm supposed to fix everything, you know? And so that feels hard to be very honest with you. It feels like, you know, as we, um, even this year in at American, we were able to hire, hire some diverse um, faculty members, and I'm just like, thank God, you know, like it's just sort of a lot of work. And then when you're asked to be on different committees because you're trying to diversify because this faculty member is problematic, it's just like, it's exhausting, right? The other thing I'll say very quickly is that at least within the clinical setting, there has been some movement, right? So there has been an a, a increase in diversity of faculty of color in the clinician space, but a lot of them have been in South Asian, actually. And there's been a lot of conversations about disaggregating the data, right? Like, you know, we're seen as a model minority and then there's sort of like Afro Latinx or, you know, sort of other groups that have not got the same level of success in academia. And we don't want to be the ones who are like pretend, letting them pretend that they're diversifying when it's like really just South Asian. So I have been really um, political about that because I don't want to be used as someone who's just like the easy minority that people are getting. And so that's sort of a story of our lives. And 9-11 was that blip where, you know, we were then sort of seen as the suspects, but you know, our lives have been, my life has been the model minority. And so in academia, I don't, I'm trying to resist that because the stats are very clear that the, the browning of academics in the clinic space is really the South Asians. Um, so those are the two things that I'll mention. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting to hear from both of you. I, you know, first it should be known that we are still a very underrepresented group um, in the legal academy and in the legal profession. Um, I would agree with Asha that, you know, a lot of it is being the first. So um, you don't know how to, mom says, what's the LSAT, right? Like you don't, you don't know what the starting points are. You know, maybe you have, I see smiles, maybe you have a little of that too. Um, even for, you know, those of us fortunate enough to have parents who are educated, you know, most are not lawyers, right? So you might still be a first time law student um, or first time academic, which is another morass, right? For, um, for, for many people. 
Uh, I was the first South Asian faculty member um, at Penn State Law um, for a very long time. Uh, now there's a second. Um, so I, I don't feel this rich representation um, of, of my community um, at Penn State Law. Um, but I, I do feel you know, very fortunate to make sure that's not the same for the next generation, right? So this past August, um, we, so the SETI, who just another South Asian who just became Dean at CUNY Law, um, she and I um, put on a, a sort of first time workshop for Asian American women um, entering the legal academy. And it was, it was eye opening. There were over a hundred women in attendance, um, you know, asking questions about how to get into the profession, how to get into the legal academy with all the same questions that, you know, my generation had um, when they started. So I think there's still a real gap to fill when it comes to training the next generation of academics in the South Asian community and Asian community more broadly. And we now have some base um, um, for, for that support. Um, I would also agree that with students, yeah, there, there is a service burden, is what they call it in, in academia, where you know, people who identify with you are the ones who are going to be vulnerable with you and want your help and want to talk through things. Um, and it's, it's a tremendous amount of work that I think each of us will take on um, for um, significant reasons. Um, but I'm also hopeful, right? Because I also think that the next generation of lawyers and law professors um, will be more equipped um, and um, have mentors, right? Because that's, I think, what our generation was lacking um, as they navigate what they're gonna do next um, in the legal space. I totally agree with everything that's been said. And that conference, Shoba, was awesome that um, you guys planned. So that was, and I, um, over the summer, I was thinking like how awesome it would have been to have that, you know, kind of community um, for a longer time. So I'm so glad that you guys are building that community. But in law school, um, there were about, I was just trying to count, I think six South Asians in, in, at Northwestern while I was there. And I was one of the people that was the co-founder of SALSA, the South Asian Law Students Association at Northwestern. And it was so, you know, but I had the benefit of having my mentor at Northwestern. She was uh, was Dorothy Roberts, who was my crim law professor. And then I kind of took every class she taught, and she really um, she, she really inspired me personally, and then also encouraged me um, to think about academia, which I hadn't kind of thought about. Um, and so I think like the solidarity with other people of color within the legal academic field is, you know, I think it's important in general, but I think it's really um, stronger because there's just so few of us in most faculties. Um, and so right now at SMU on, on my faculty, I'm the second woman of color on the faculty right now. And before that, you know, um, there was only one black woman of color. And so currently, and so um, it's, it's definitely, we need to diversify, but I totally agree with Anita too. I think that when I've been on appointments, there is a difference in having different kinds of representation. And I think that um, just because you have one person <laughs> that you know checks off a minority box, that doesn't mean that you have representation. And I think, um, especially those of us who, you know, really want to see the the law school faculty reflect the demographics of law schools and the United States. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, but I wouldn't say I, you know, I think that the there's people of color conferences that I was part of from the beginning of my legal academic career, which were basically kind of conferences in different parts of the country where you can present your work to other minority uh, legal academics. And the first one that I went to was my first year of teaching. And I did, I mean, it was a horrible job. Like I, I, I was so nervous. I, you know, came in and I was like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. And they were so nice and supportive. And I came back to my law school and the person in charge of the session had written a letter to my dean, and she was like a full professor at a high rank law school uh, about what a great job I had done, which 
was definitely not true, but, um, you know, it was that kind of community. Um, I think, you know, seeking out that community is important. Well, um, just in the interest of time, I wanted to move on to the last question because I think that is probably one of the most important ones that students probably want to hear from you all. And um, I just want to say thank you all so much for your responses thus far. They've been uh, very insightful and I've been taking notes and um, just trying to really take in everything that you're saying because I think it's so uh, valuable. So thank you all for that. So with uh, this last question being, do you have any advice for students who want to become law professors or seek to work in academia one day? Go ahead, Amy. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think Shola mentioned this earlier in terms of what she said, she had her mentors and bosses. You've got to really keep in touch with your your folks, people who, you know, you, you, you find the mentors where you find them, they may not be at your first job or they may not be, you know, sort of everyone from school, but when you find those mentors, just continue to keep in touch with them. So I entered academia 12 years after practicing, very, not, not that unusual for clinic, but just unusual generally, but I kept in touch with folks and, and generally so it wasn't, you know, I told you I, I turned down a second year clerkship so I wasn't looking for academic um, positions, but, you know, it really helped that I had kept, kept in touch with folks. And then just sort of follow your heart, right? So similar to, again, what Shoba said in terms of like, you know, randomly, like do what you wanna do and then see where that takes you, right? And so, and then if it's, if it's teaching, cause teaching is extremely rewarding. I do feel really like lucky every day when I like see my law school and I walk in, I still like, you know, 10 years later, I still feel chills. And so it's a great place to be, but I did it because it got, you know, it, it made sense in terms of my next step. And so just continue what you're doing. And then you have here, you have four mentors here. So, you know, keep in touch with us. And, and I really, I, I do, I, I was part of a University of Denver, unusual um, sort of uh, market candidates this summer. They had a series of, of trainings on like the job talk, the callbacks and all that stuff. And I, I really, every time I see something like that, I say yes, because I, I do want to transmit the information, like as Asha and Samir said, you know, we're first. And so I want to make sure that in interstitial spaces, they have um, those. So, so to the extent that you see those offered, you know, sign up for it. And, you know, even if you're not thinking about entering academia, um, sort of, you just started, you know, your, your career, but just, just tune in and see what sort of is expected. So you have that knowledge. It's interesting, everybody's path, even just in this group, is so different to academia. And so I think right there is a bit of a lesson. And I think for the students, you know, you have access to probably at least 20 professors in your one, two, three L year, something like that. And so you already have a community of professors from whom you could learn what was their path. And I'm guessing everyone's path is vastly different. It isn't like there's a cookie cutter. Well, everybody kind of followed this and then, then they checked a box and now they're in academia, right? You'll probably have four times 10, 40, different professors giving you 40 different paths. And so I would say use your network that you already have, your students, you're, you know, you're already there. Um, and so learning from the professors you have, whether they're South Asian or not, um, just a quick going to office hours and saying, just wondered how you got into this. How did, you know, and I can bet you're going to find some fascinating, interesting stories about how they got into what they're doing or why they do it. And maybe they're also doing other things. I definitely see a lot of folks in academia are kind of keeping up with some other things outside of the law school. That can be such a rich opportunity for law students to learn more about. Maybe those conversations result in a fellowship or an internship or a research project um, because you took an interest to find out more about their skills and their passions. Um, I'm always offering to students publication opportunities. You know, I have lots of ideas in my head, but I don't have time to write everything. Um, that are more practitioner focused, short pieces, five to 10 pages that we could get published pretty quickly. You know, something that you found was interesting in class and you want to write more about it. Let's work together and I'll work on getting, you know, finding where we could publish that. You know, so there can be opportunities that are right there for you. Um, and we want that because going back to the earlier question, we want to build this pipeline. Like if we look around and think our group is still kind of slim or a little lighter than we would want it to be, we can't change that so much at our level per se, right? Because there has to be this pipeline that builds up to that 
level of academia, um, academic seniority or whatever the, it is, partnership or whatever. So we want to help this, your generation of students to position yourself. The most important thing I tell everyone I ever meet in the last 20 years, students, young lawyers, what have you, develop your skills. That's what makes you valuable. I may be a partner to firm. I often say the junior associate knows much more about a regulation than I do. Why? Because he or she's diving into it and being forced to read the painful 800 pages. I'm not, I don't have that kind of time. I'm relying on you to really know the ins and outs of a regulation. So we don't have to worry that only someone who's been out 30 years is an expert. You can become an expert. You can find something that you really care about and dive deeply into it. And you start to show that you have that value. And then you take that value wherever you want to go, whatever the position is, including academia. I really don't have a lot to add. I, I fully agree with what's already been said. I, I, will, I will add to the last point um, because it's also tied to self-doubt, right? And so, um, you know, really tell yourself that, you know, and remind yourself that you belong at the table, right? And that you belong in the academy if that's the route you want to take. Um, so don't let self-doubt, um, you know, get the best of you, you know, um, and, and instead, you know, focus on the 800 page reg um, and develop your expertise. And the, the last point, because we've been talking about mentors and I think mentors in your community um, are important, but it's also great to have allies and mentors who are cookie cutter, right? And who are not in your community, who are going to advocate for you, right? So um, do not limit who should be your mentor and advocate. Um, if your contracts professor who's been teaching for 40 years is, you know, if you're his biggest fan, you know, let him be an advocate for you um, because, you know, those mentors are also uh, matter a lot in the journey. Yeah, I don't have much to add. Um, I, you know, I think that there's probably, if you are thinking about academia, there's probably some things that, you know, most people that go into academia do like a clerkship, which I didn't do because I wanted to go and start paying off my loans right away. So, you know, think there are some career choices, but as you can see, you know, a lot of us have different choices that we've made and, you know, we're still at the same place. So there's many paths to the same um, place, but I would say, you know, really build those relationships with your professors in law school, because, um, you know, I'm glad that I was really nice to my professors in law school, but it has been really shocking to me that professors that I didn't really think I knew that well in law school, like will show up at a talk that I'm giving and be like, I needed to see my former student. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? Um, and so these, these relationships that you have, uh, you know, most of your professors, um, especially, and it doesn't really matter how you did in their class, you know, they want to see their students succeed. That's one of the reasons they're in that job and they are, you know, um, really are cheerleaders. So you can definitely ask them and there are different kinds of paths in legal academia. And so, you know, you can, if you want to be kind of an adjunct and doing it part-time, if you want to be doing, you know, legal writing, or if you want to be doing clinical work and actually practicing as well, if you want to be, you know, teaching the first year doctrinal class, there's so many different paths and they all look a little different depending on what school. So, you know, kind of just finding out about it, um, I think, is um, is a good idea and just and I totally agree with show but that the mentors don't have to be at all within your community I think it's more effective actually you know to have a wide variety uh, of people that are advocating um, for you um, and Dorothy Roberts has been yeah, I graduated from law school in 2000 and she has been um, a reference for me for like every job I've had since then. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and, you know, she'll just ask me like, what have you been doing right now? <laughs> you know, it's because it's been so long, but um, so those keep those relationships up. I love that everyone's touching on uh, mentorship because I will definitely be in your inboxes right after this event. So keep posted for my email. And just to all of those watching and for you professors, we have a mentorship program for NSALSA. So please sign up and join that uh, because we have 
actually quite a bit of students signing up wanting mentors. So if you all are interested and have some time, it's low time commitment, I promise. And we really are connecting students from all across North America. So I think it'd be a great program for all of you to join if you're interested. Um, and thank you for volunteering to be a mentor for me. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to wrap this event up by, of course, thanking our wonderful professors for taking the time to be here. So just a quick applause, yes. Um, thank you all so much. This has been such a really insightful and valuable panel. I have took a lot from it. And I know that those that are watching and that are going to watch this recording posted on our website are also going to find it equally very valuable. Uh, just for our newsletter that's coming out in March, I did wanna take a group photo. So if that's okay, just a quick uh, smile. Okay, three, two. Awesome. All right, great. Well, thank you all so much again. And um, please reach out if you have any questions at all and take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good job, guys. Okay, thanks, y'all. See you later. Great job, guys.